Welcome to 4C363. How many of you are here are 600 level students? Okay, good. Thank you. I was, just didn't get a class list yet for 600 level students. So we've got a class of 100 people, 90 plus 10. Um, it's surprising that it's a bigger class than the mandatory 4N course. I'm not sure how an elective can have more people than a um, uh, mandatory course, but anyway, that's how it is. So I'm going to just talk about background from this course today. The um, slides are posted on the website, however, if you didn't get a chance to download these, no problem, today's material in here is just an overview of what the course is going to be. Uh, so most of you know me, you've seen me in uh, 4M or 4M or both. Um, I, I um, came from South Africa, I was in Cape Town, immigrated to Canada in 2000 uh, unintentionally. I came here just to do uh, three and then I ended up staying. Friends, you have a good job. So um, I've been in and around the university since 2000. I've worked with a number of companies on statistics and data analysis, and most of that is due to the tremendous infrastructure that we have here at the university. With my class, I can't be talking to you. I that in a minute. Um, most recently, I worked at Glassdoor on the data analysis projects. That was one year contract in June, and then we started this coming in July. So if you're looking to get a hold of me, the best times are Wednesday afternoons, Thursday, Wednesday mornings, Thursday afternoons and Friday afternoons. The rest of the week I'm tied up either giving classes or taking classes myself, um, so I'm not available on other times. However, don't just show up at my door, though if, if it's an emergency, for sure do that, but the best is just to arrange a meeting ahead of time by email with me. Um, that's, that's going to be the best way to set a time and make sure that I'm available for you. Um, if you need to speak to me over the phone, I do prefer email, but if you need to use the phone, use my cell and I'll be the best to answer that. Um, so my objective for this course is essentially what's written up here. I want to make this worthwhile. This is going to be one of the most practical courses you take at the university. You'll be able to use this material right away when you start to graduate. Or so when you graduate, when you start working on it. Okay, so my recommendation is there might be a number of you who are in this class that this is not your final year. If you're going to be at Mac for another year, I suggest you take this course next year. I don't want to kick you out of my class. I certainly like to have a good group of students. However, you will find the most benefit if this material is fresh in your head just before you start working. Um, but if you want to stay in the class, by all means, that's, that's your decision, and you will still benefit from material in your fourth year, and then hopefully you remember it and, and use it for your article when you start working. But I can guarantee you there is something in this course that you will use in your career the day you start working. And I'll talk about some of the things you will be using from this course in your career. But uh, before I get going, I would like to acknowledge that this course is being built up by John McGregor. So I looked back through all the course calendars in the university and the earliest mention I found for 4C3 was in 1983. So that's when the course started. John was a new professor here at the university um, and he instituted this course. And the course outline has been exactly the same since 1983. Which is good because it shows the foresight that John had that the important material that you need to understand when you go out to work. So John, when he started the course, had finished working at Monsanto. He finished his PhD with George Box, who was one of the most eminent statisticians in the United States. Came to Mac and then instituted this course, and that's what we built. We've been building on here ever since. Um, so I'll keep that going. Um, but I also want to acknowledge the McMaster Advanced Control Consortium. So this is a consortium in the in the university in the chemical engineering department led by Dr. Chris Schwartz, and a number of companies, I think it's well over 12 or 15 companies, contribute to the research and the projects of the graduate students. So the PhD and master students in the control consortium, they're working on topics relevant to problems that these companies suggest. Okay, so when I finished up in 2002, I worked for the MACC for three, four years um, as, a, as a research <coughs> role and worked with a number of these companies so a lot of the data sets, a lot of the problems we'll be dealing with in the course come from those problems that I work with. Then I started a company with John McGregor and one of his students from the review and we uh, developed ProSensus. Um, and that's an existing company that's now out of Ancaster and has grown to about 12, 13 people. And they work only on data analysis problems. 
So I worked for ProSensus for a number of years. We'll be using some um, data sets and ideas from those, those uh, projects I worked on over there. But those are in disguise because I've signed all sorts of confidentiality agreements, so I can't reveal the details there. But the ideas behind those projects uh, will come through in this course. They shape the material that I'll be teaching. Okay, so all of that comes through in these uh, experience that I've had over the past 10 years. And I hope to make that course relevant, this course relevant in that way. So just to start off with, um, I'd like to introduce the two TAs. We only have one here, unfortunately. I forgot to email Shailesh and let him know the class time. But uh, Miriam is here. Um, Miriam is doing her PhD with Dr. John Zakopoulos. Do you want to say anything and introduce yourself? Uh, sure. My name is Miriam. I'm doing my PhD with Dr. John Zakopoulos right now. So uh, if you have any questions or do you, do you need to talk to me, please just send me an email. Uh, I think it's in the offline of the, on, the, on the website. Then we can arrange the time just coming in for you and me, and then we can go from there. We're trying um, something different this time. We're not setting up official TA hours or office hours just because the TA ends up seeing no one or the time just doesn't work for most people in the class. So what we'd rather do is that you arrange with the TA Mutual belief agreed at the time. Uh, don't just show up at Miriam's or Shalesh's door and, and expect them to help you, but please email them ahead of time and set up a mutually convenient time, and that way uh, we can actually use the TH resources. Okay, thanks, Miriam. Okay, so the rest of um, <coughs> here is about the course website. This is the only way I'll be communicating with you, as, uh, as most of you know from the other courses I've taught. Uh, it's not an avenue website. Uh, what I will do is I'll post all the slides, all the, all the assignment material to the website, details about the course project, solutions to the assignments, solutions to the midterms, all of that goes over there. Videos and, and audio recordings of the classes will get posted to the website. There's many uh, data sets as well, specific to this course, and resources like tables of normal and t-distributions, tables related to designers experiments. So all of those are available as PDFs and, and uh, you should download them, print them out to bring them to class. I expect you to check the website about three to five times a week. As I said, I will only communicate uh, with you that way. So for those of you not familiar with the, with the course website, this is what it looks like. And when I make an announcement, they'll appear here in this area here, in the announcement section. Um, I also got some good feedback from the 4M and 4N course evaluations last term. By the way, um, the course evaluations that you filled out in November, December, I posted those on the 4N and 4M website so you can read those. Um, but some interesting things that came out of that that I've been using now in this course is uh, people asked to have these announcements available automat automatically pushed to them. So I've set up a Twitter feed for this course that uh, any announcements will also get posted there to Twitter and you can get the announcements pushed to you rather than wait to check the website. Uh, so that's that's for any of the Video. I do video record all my classes. So except in 2011 when I didn't have uh, the opportunity to do that. I only have audio for 2011, but 2010, 2012, those videos are on the course website and then the videos from this video will also be available there. So my, my purpose of the videos is, I see it as either you can come eat in or you can take out. Like you come to class or you can come and watch the video at home at your own convenience. Eating in is a much better experience. Right? You get full service, that is, it's, it's better quality sound, you can see the board more clearly. The audio on the um, on the video recording often picks up noise in the passage and the noise in the back of the class. Um, the clarity of the picture may not be quite the best. Um, and that's one one thing I can't change too much. Unfortunately, this class has a lot of white surface area, white roof, white boards, white projector screen. And so a lot of the detail in the slides gets washed out to all of that. So uh, the video may not be the best quality. I've tried find the best lighting settings. I did a design experiment and I found the best lighting settings that, that gets the best clarity. However, I can't guarantee it's going to always work. Okay, so I like to have you in class. If you can't make it, please uh, catch up with the video. The other thing is, as I've said to my other classes, is when I was taking grand courses at Mac, the time I actually really understood the material was the second time I took the course. Okay. So if you 
don't get the material the first time I teach it in class. Please go home, watch it again the second, third time, stop, pause, rewind, whatever you need to to go through the second time. I don't want to have to wait to see you again here in 2014 to see it the second time. Okay, so, so make use of that opportunity that way. Let's talk about the course textbook. Um, I've, I've written the course textbook that you'll be using for this uh, course. It's uh, LearnCHE, Meisters.ch.pie, Process Improvement Using Data. So when I started this course in 2010, um, I thought while I was doing the slides, well, let me write on some extra notes. And while I was writing on those extra notes, they turned out to be two, 300 pages later, a book. So <laughs> there's a book related to this course. But it's not a book that there's a first, second, third edition. It is a book that's changing every week. So when I teach this course, I'm making updates to that book every every week, or every day almost. And I post the updates to the website immediately. So if you choose to print out the book today, or purchase it in the bookstore, the bookstore has the version that was um, written on the 3rd of January this year. That is a snapshot of the book at that time. Five weeks, 10 weeks from now, the book is going to be out of date. Not dramatically. What I'm talking about is grammatical errors, semantic <coughs> errors. I reword paragraphs to try and explain things better. I maybe add a diagram or two. So it's quite okay if you go buy the book from the title that's right now. They've got it available for 35 bucks. It's just black and white printed, no color printing. If you print it out, you can print it out on your parents' color laser printer at home and use their game and get it for free. That's fine, or uh, whatever your choice. But. Um, it is available, so you don't have to purchase any textbook for this course. However, if you do want to buy a book, I highly recommend Box Hunter and Hunt. So remember I said John McGregor's PhD supervisor was George Box? That's the box in Box Hunter and Hunter. So he wrote this book along with his two colleagues, Hunter and Hunter. Excellent, excellent textbook. I cannot recommend this highly enough. So if you're the type of person who buys books and will plan to keep them for your career, this is a phenomenally good book. These guys write from an industrial perspective how you can actually use data and data analysis. It's not your boring stats textbook that you've used in other courses, perhaps. Okay, so it's not filled with tables and tables of normal distributions and derivations of the chi-square distribution and t-distribution and distribution. This is a practical applied book. Okay? So I've used that concept in my own book, PID, Process Improvement Using Data, and um, so I suggest you use the PID book as a supplement to the slides. If you're looking for anything extra, please uh, use the stats book, or there's a multitude of other references on the course website. A few of them are also MOOCs, uh, Massive Online, uh, um, MOOCs that forget, Massive Online, ah, course, some, there's, there's another O there, see, it, anyway, it's a large distributed course that are uh, run. There's several statistics courses that are run with excellent professors teaching them. Their videos, their course materials, their data sets are all online. And I've referenced the few of those on the course that we as well. So plenty of material to go into if you're interested. Now, uh, again, I've, I've kept the uh, part of the website up. So many of you have used this in the past. You can send me anonymous feedback here about how things are going in the course, uh, things that you don't understand, topics that are um, confusing for you, or suggestions to improve the course. So uh, please feel free to use that. If you choose not to put your email address here, I can't reply to you. Um, but I will try to take it up in class the next time if it's relevant to the class. Okay. Any questions on that so far? Any on those administrative details? About the textbooks, about the websites? So let me go on then and talk a bit about the computer software requirements for this course. Uh, there is the need for computer software. There's no point in giving you a statistics and data analysis course and you're only doing things by hand. So the vast majority of the assignments will require computer-based answers. We will be using the R statistical computing language, which you have used and been exposed to in your prerequisite stats course if you're taking it at Mac. Now before you all groan and, and, and sob because of R and the terrible way you've probably been taught it in your undergraduate courses, we'll be taking a different approach. There is a tutorial, a comprehensive tutorial, that you can go through um, at that link over there that I set up a few years ago. 
Um, I will also be using a slightly different interface to R. I found um, a, a better version of the interface to R that one of my previous students emailed me uh, just yesterday, in fact. And I looked at it and it was phenomenally good compared to the traditional R interface. So I'm just going to spend the next day or two writing up some tutorial material on installing and using that version of R. But I'm going to go ahead with R. Initially, I was also going to go ahead with Python, MATLAB, and Minitab. Um, but then over the Christmas break, I've been looking a bit more into Python and MATLAB. MATLAB costs money, and the statistics toolbox has not got all the features we need. Python has all the features we need, but not quite to scratch to the level of R that I would like to see. Maybe if you're going to be Googling for something, like how do I create a normal distribution in R, you're going to find the answer. In fact, you're going to find a thousand different answers and you're going to get something. But with Python, it's not quite up to that level of comprehensive um, data that's out there to help you out. So I do suggest you use R. I will support other languages, however. So if you do plan to use MATLAB or Minitab or Python, definitely go ahead, speak with me. I can help you out on getting those set up and running the computer. The reason why I chose to use R and have been using it for the past four years in this course is because it's so widely used by Google, Pfizer, all the big names will use this internally in their companies. Um, it runs on all operating systems, so a number of you, based on how you access my website, I see that a lot, a lot of you use Macs, a lot of you use Linux, and many of you use Windows. So we need a software that package that works on all those platforms, and R does that. Um, it's got excellent add-ins for anything related to data analysis. So anytime someone writes a, a journal publication on a new statistical idea, they invariably write an R library that they publish as well to go with it's the first language they choose to write their, their research in. So you've got cutting edge material available to you to extend the functionality of R. The great advantage is that it's free, even for commercial use. So it's not like some of the other software packages that limit you free for academic use. R is free for everyone, which is an important point. You may not believe this, but companies will not spend a $2,000 license fee you as an engineer to buy a MATLAB license. I've worked in companies with large dollar budgets, they will not spend even that small amount of money. Okay. So if you're not able to do your work in a company, that's going to really hurt you. Using R means that you can install that software on your computer or have the company install it for you at no cost and you can get ahead of it. Okay. So it's a tremendous advantage. And then the other thing is that R promotes excellent statistical practice. You may not like writing source code. You're used to something like Excel where you can point and click and generate a graph and get through your data that way. That is not good data analysis practice because it's not reproducible. You give that spreadsheet to one of your colleagues, two years later they open it up, they have no idea how you generated that graph. In R, you put all the commands line after line set up exactly showing your train of thought and it's reproducible. And if you're working in an environment with any regulatory requirements, government regulations, you need to show reproducibility. How you go from the first data set right up to the end of how you generated the statistical output. And R has that for you. We've got a line by line record that shows every single step it took to get to the output. So it promotes that excellent, excellent statistical practice that you don't get from the point and click software like Minitab, which a lot of companies love to use, but unfortunately it has that point and click interface. Excel is another bad one for that. So please don't use Excel for this course. It's not a good package at all for, for data analysis on a, for a large number of reasons. Okay. Please use a, a, a tool like MATLAB, Python, or R. Okay, so here's just a screenshot of a newspaper article that was run in the New York Times uh, two, three years ago, talking about uh, how R is so widely used in a number of, of companies. Okay, um, any questions on the software? Um, I will, as the course progresses, I will demonstrate R's use in class and some of the other, other languages from time to time. So you will get an opportunity to see that. But the expectation is that you work through the installation and use of that program through those tutorials that are on the course website.
Okay, let me talk a bit about what the course is about. Um, I'll skip over this slide and I'll talk about the course uh, diagrammatically instead. So we are surrounded by a huge amount of data, more so than 10 years ago. So this little cell phone you carry in your pocket is capturing all sorts of information all the time. If you've got an Android operating system on your phone, there's so much data that's being tracked about you, generated about you all the time. GPS signals, frequency of email coming in and out, text messages, all of that is being used to, to generate data, with, and you use it and consume it as well. You benefit from, from that. Um, so that's a, that's a simple data source. Other simple data sources we've been exposed to as engineers are temperatures, flows, pressures, dimensions, pH. These are all things that are measured in an automated way in a factory environment or a plant environment. Lab samples, these are more tedious, but they get taken nevertheless and generate fairly large quantities of data. And there's trends now for lab management and electronic lab notebooks to capture all this laboratory data that we're surrounded with. If you've ever worked in a company for a co-op term, you've maybe been exposed to a data distorted, like Pi, uh, or some of the other, other software packages from GE. These, these data distorted collect data on the millisecond level, um, second level, or minute level, or hour level from sensors around the company. So at one company I worked with, uh, Petro Canada, we collected on the order of about 20 megabytes per second. So that generates a large quantity of data by the end of the day, by the end of the year. You have a tremendous amount of information, uh, data available. If you don't have information, you have a lot of data. So how are you going to use it? How are you going to get value from that data? Uh, we'll talk a bit about image data and batch process data throughout the course. Other data that you may have been aware of are spectral data, near infrared spectra, UV spectra, IR spectra. These are collected at different wavelengths. You've certainly been exposed to that in your chemistry course. We'll talk a bit about some of those. Some of the more interesting data sources that are now starting to become used in companies are acoustical data. They'll install, install acoustical <coughs> sensors and accelerometers onto pipes, onto other devices in the plant, motors, and they use that to track the health and the activity of that, of that unit and use it to schedule maintenance based on the interesting data that's captured in the frequency domain from that sensor. If you're going to the store or a bank or any time you're taking out a debit card, credit card or cash, you're performing some form of transaction, there's a lot of information on that transaction and data that you generate. And companies use that. Loyalty cards, so if you go to the LCDO and you're buying your 2-4 and then you also take out, uh, what's that blue card that they always ask for? Air miles. miles. So that's tracking all sorts of information and they use that and tie it up with your purchase history and it's used to send you special offers in the mail targeted specifically to your demographic and your previous purchase history. So a company make a lot of use of this, this data set. This is a very sparse large 2D data set with a lot of empty holes because not every customer buys two folds. So there's a lot of empty, empty, empty data cells and missing data in those data sets. But tremendous value that can be extracted from that transaction data. Not important to you being young, but as you get older and older and your joints start to creak and you're going to need MRIs to diagnose the health of your joints. CT scans, ECG scans, all of these medical imaging sources, these are only three, but there's, tr there's a tremendous number of other um, ways of acquiring medical data. Those generate up to 5D images of your body. So there's the three dimensions and there's time as well thrown in through there and multiple slices through time going. So these medical data sets get very large gigabytes of information per patient get acquired. That's just data, it's not information. How do you extract valuable information from the data? So we've got a lot of this around us. Let's make the most of it. So that's what this course is about. Here's a quote from Ankit, who uh, took this class in 2010 when I taught him for the first time. Then he went to go work for Tenova the year afterwards. And he sent me this email a few months into his job over there, saying, I need to look at on a daily basis, I look at a gigantic amount of data required to make sense of it. I think what I love most about the course is the emphasis on thinking and the process of getting to a solution, instead of just the final solution itself. So that's what I aim for here, is how do we work through the data and actually understand what the data is giving us. 
I don't really actually care that you've got a large quantity of data. Okay. Like I've said in my previous courses, it's not the size of your data set that matters, it's what you do with it. Okay. It's really <laughs> what you get out of that data set and how do you understand what, what's going on with it. Okay. So, so that's important. And I'll talk about Tiffany's example at PepsiCo in my class tomorrow. So in the class tomorrow, we start with data visualization. Data visualization is the first step that you must always do on a data set. You take that data set and you're going to generate some interesting plots. Time series plots, bar plots, box plots. We'll just cover a few of the basics. I'll show you examples of some good plots and I'll show you some examples of bad plots and how not to, how not to visualize data. There's some important topics there on color and despite the fact that we're visualizing data, there are occasions when looking at data in a table form is actually a superior way of understanding what's going on. So we'll, we'll look at that as well in the class tomorrow and on Friday. Then we'll get to really what is, is um, a basic review of univariate statistics. The first part of this is where we really just recap all the stuff you learned in your stat prerequisites. We'll look at some histograms, probability, a few distributions, and understand from an engineering perspective what the purpose of those distributions are. So we're not going to derive p and x is equal to so and so and integrate it and find probabilities that way. I'm not interested in that. We use the computer to do those sorts of things. But what we want to do is apply those to engineering problems and find the benefit of uh, information in those distributions. So remember I said at the beginning we've got a lot of data. We don't have information. What we want to get to is information. We want to get value from that data. How do we get some valuable information? Well, we work through these histograms and probability distributions to capture some information, summarize those data in a meaningful way. Um, so I'll talk about what variability really is and, and why it's useful to us. Um, if life did not have any variability, we actually would not have jobs as engineers. So we'll talk a bit about that in the class um, in section two. We'll have to recap some things related to independence and the central limit theorem. Those are very important concepts that propagate throughout the course in all the subsequent sections. Okay. One thing about 4C363 is that it's cumulative. This material in every section is used in the following section. It's been specifically designed in the order that it is. Okay. So we must understand these concepts early on We'll see them over and over again in subsequent sections. Then you've looked at uh, testing for differences in your previous course, so whether one variable is different to another uh, using a hypothesis test. I'll throw away hypothesis test. It's a useless way of looking at it. We'll look at a far more interesting and conceptually intuitive way of looking at hypothesis tests in, um, in that next section. And then finally, we'll also look at some pair tests. That's an important introduction to the later section of the design experiments. The third section is a shortish section. Uh, so the section two is about two weeks. Uh, then we'll end at the end of January uh, with uh, looking at process monitoring charts. These are important charts that you see in an, any control room. So when you walk into an operating control room at a company, you'll see all sorts of charts and displays on their screen. That's why we need to understand the visualization section we saw first. Then we also need univariate data analysis. Now we're going to bring those two sections together, section one and section two, combine them into section three, and look at how to construct these charts. So these are visualization charts that capture useful univariate statistic information from the data source. So we'll understand what Shua charts and exponentially graded moving averages charts are about and how they're used. Who's heard of the term Six Sigma? Okay, so sections one, two, three, four, and five of this course are essentially what you'll learn in a Six Sigma class, but in a different aspect. Six Sigma courses often put a different spin on the way that they are, uh, introduce the material, but a lot of the topics you'll learn in the Six Sigma course come through here, especially in section three. Process capability is exactly where we learn what a Six Sigma process is. But I'm not going to teach it from that perspective. What we're going to look at is we're going to look at this perspective from a univariate data analysis. What does Sigma mean? And then what does a Six Sigma process mean by definition? Okay, so we come at it from a very different angle uh, than the traditional courses that are taught in Six Sigma companies. 
And then at the end, I'll look at a few examples of how these monitoring charts are used very effectively. And uh, the example I'll use is here in from Hamilton at Arsenal Intel, for example, in Alaska. So they've instituted a number of very successful data analysis projects over the past uh, 20 years or so. Um, and we'll take a look at one of those examples. Then uh, the first two weeks of February, we'll look at these squares. So these squares, and maybe we'll spend a third week if necessary, but we're going to look at a quick recap of ordinary least squares that you've seen before. We'll look at what the concept of correlation and, co and uh, covariance is again. Those are important two ideas that carry through in these squares. Analysis of variance, confidence intervals. That whole section, we saw section two on univariate data analysis, we construct confidence intervals and we understand what univariate confidence intervals mean in a least squares model. How can you interpret that the coefficient in a least squares model is significant or not? And if you make a prediction from a least squares model, so y, y hat is equal to some intercept plus a slope times x, you plug that into a least squares model, you're getting a y hat. But what is the prediction error on that y hat? We want to know the plus or minus. And predicting y plus or minus a certain bound, what is that prediction interval? There's a whole lot of assumptions that go into a least squares model. What do they mean? And importantly, what is the implication when you break those assumptions? Almost every least squares model that you've built in the past in Excel Naively, you've probably broken several or many of the assumptions that a least squares model required to be true. What is the implication of breaking those, and how does that change our interpretation of the model? Then we'll move on to more than two variables. So now you're adding in a third variable or a fourth variable. That's B2, X2, that's B3, X3. What does it mean? How do you interpret these regression coefficients, B1, B2? and B3. Okay, there's an important interpretability aspect here. I'm not interested in calculating B1, B2, B3. We we'll let the computer do that for us. I'm far more interested in what do those regression coefficients mean, so the model interpretation. What does it mean if X1 here is an integer variable? For example, male or female. How can I interpret that regression coefficient now if B1 represents male or female, or if it represents university education, no university education? Okay, so we've got these binary variables. Or what if there's three levels to that variable? So high school, university, postgraduate. How do we code those variables? What do the least squares model regression coefficients mean in those cases? So integer variables are an important um, important least squares concept that you probably have not been exposed to before. So that will be new for most of you. Uh, and then the key here is how do we use the software and, and interpret the model output? Because we're not going to build these least squares models by hand. Never ever do we calculate these things by hand. How do we use the software output and interpret it? Section five is the whole of March. This is probably the most important part of the course. We're going to learn how to do effective experimental design where you plan to extract the most information from a company's data, from a chemical plant with the fewest number of experiments. You will never be allowed to run experiments, almost never be allowed to run experiments in the company. Your boss is not going to give you free reign and adjust the variables up and down wherever you like. But there are limited times when we do that. And when we do that, we have very small window of opportunity how can we get the most value from those experimental data in the smallest number of experiments possible? So to get to that, we need to first understand why we randomize experiments. We'll go through factorial designs all the way to fractional factorial designs. This is where you get a few number of experiments, and you will run a course project on this. You'll be, during March, running your own experiment on your own topic of interest. Okay, so there's a number of examples on the course website. You can start to think about different experimental ideas, run those by me in January, February, by email, um, take a look at some of the projects on the website, but you're going to be running your own experiments and determining and, and experiencing how to get the most amount of information with the fewest number of experiments. Experiments are expensive, okay? we really cannot run a lot of them, so we need to be able to run them in an optimal way. 
So we'll spend the whole of March on experiments. And then at the end, time committing, and we should have some time, um, I'd like to introduce the topic of latent variable methods. So latent variable methods are methods that extract data, and uh, extract information from multiple columns of data simultaneously, which is what most real data sets are, multiple columns of data. We'll look at what is a latent variable. We'll look at understanding just what it means conceptually. We won't go into any of the math behind it. This topic alone is a graduate level course. So I've taught a graduate level course here at Mac 765 in this before. It's a 13 week course that really focuses only on these methods. We do not have the time for that, um, but we will at least introduce the topic of the two or three classes so you get a taste of what these methods can do for you. Okay. But by and large, this is what you will likely have to use in the future when you work in a company. So if you're interested in this topic, there's all the videos, all the course materials on latent variables on, on a separate website uh, for you to look at at some future point in time. And throughout the course, I'll be putting in some, some topics based on some of my experience. We'll look at some robust methods, cross validation, real time applications of stats methods, and uh, what happens when you've got a data set with missing data. In fact, some of the course assignments will have data sets with missing data, so you're going to have to figure out what, to, what you can do with that. Okay, now let's talk in the last few minutes here just about the, the grading part of this course, which is, which is important. Um, as most of you have come to realize, my courses are not just about quad and chub, and that's true of this course as well. So in the order of importance, this is what I look for when I grade, is that you understand the material, and that you can apply it to a totally new instance. It's not possible that we can look at all the different and interesting ways of data analysis in this course. But the concepts of univariate data analysis, data visualization, experiments, these can be applied to any topic. And I will show a number of non-chemical engineering topics throughout the course as well, to show you how we can apply these to various instances. But I expect you to be able to do the same as well in the assignments and the tests that come up. So you need to think creatively about the problem sometimes and not just try to look for a problem that you can plug the values in and get to an answer. That's not valuable at all. And in fact, most of my questions in this course will almost always have a component where you explain your reasoning for the answer. This is not just getting to the answer, it's explaining why that answer is meaningful, why it makes sense, or why an, an answer differs from what your expectation is. Okay. So, so those are important aspects here in the grade. In terms of the structure of the, the grades, there's an assignment component, and these are group work, group work assignments in groups of two. Um, if you're a 4C3 student and you do the 63 questions on the assignment, you'll get extra credit for that. Uh, for 63 students, you will have those extra questions that you must complete. So that's, that's the F component of this course. As well as in tests and exams, 63 students will have additional credit. So because of the large class size, 100 or so of you, we really need to be fairly efficient on getting the material turned around in time. And to do that, um, we're going to penalize late handouts fairly severely. And the solutions to the assignments will be posted about two days after the due date. So there is a late day credit system that, uh, that goes around here. Um, two days late credit per person. You can hand in one assignment two days late, or you can hand in two assignments one day late and with no penalty. After that, the 30% per day penalty kicks in. Um, the assignments will count 20% of the course grade. There's no makeups for them. I expect to, sh when I schedule seven assignments for this course, I expect there will probably only be six. Whatever it lands up to be at the end, it, I'll drop one assignment and use the others to calculate your course grade. So you can mess up one assignment. I recommend that you spend significant effort on these earlier assignments. The earlier assignments are easier. You've got no other course materials that have got other courses that have got assignments <coughs> scheduled right now. So you can really do well on these earlier assignments. And then at the end of the course, you can leave the opportunity to have that minus one assignment dropped. Okay, so don't mess up on these early assignments. Do these ones really well, and then you can have <coughs> assignments. Um, 
based on the best that happened last, uh, last semester with all the conflicting scheduling, um, I've worked over the holidays and getting all the other instructors in the department on board to generate a calendar system. So we've got all the, all the courses have their calendars set up here now. So calendar. Um, you can go see all the due dates for all the different courses at different times over here. If you click on this, um, you can see, I don't know if I've got an internet connection right now. So if you click on that little drop down at the top here, you can uh, check box the different calendars you want to subscribe to. If you click at the bottom of this link, uh, so here at the bottom of the page, there's a little link there, plus Google Calendar. If you click on that icon, um, you can subscribe to some or all of those calendars in your own Gmail address and uh, see all those. So if the instructors change the due dates, it will automatically update your calendar. So this is a, uh, hopefully going to be a better way to prevent conflicts between different courses. So let me know if that calendaring system is working for you. If it's not working for you, let me know what we can do to improve it. We want to make sure that uh, between the different courses we minimize conflicts as best as possible. I'm really trying to push the other instructors to keep up with this system so that we, we can make sure that you have a smooth semester, this, this semester and for future semesters. Okay, so I have spoken about appropriate group work in previous classes. Let me just quickly recap here. When I say you work in groups of two, I do not mean that you take your assignment and split it in, in half and give one half to one person and half to the other. The intention of the group work is that you both do the assignment together, or sorry, both do the assignment separately, then you meet up and you exchange ideas about it. Okay? I guarantee that by the end of the course you both will not be doing this. However, the intention is that you do this. You will get the most benefit from the assignment if you learn from your partner's mistakes or your own mistakes that your partner picks up. Okay, that is the intention of the group. I will not accept groups larger than two. Unfortunately, that's been abused in previous uh, terms. So groups of two only or work alone. There's no requirement to work in a group of two. 63 students must work alone. They cannot work in groups. Okay, so here's the new part of this course. Uh, which you may have seen on the course outline, but let's talk about it uh, in the last few minutes here. If you're not experimenting, you've given up. Okay? That's my philosophy. If you're not always trying to improve that recipe that you cook every week at home on Friday night, you've given up. You need to try and keep things fresh and experiment and find an ultimate. I do that in all my courses. Every course that I teach, I'm always changing something from the previous time I taught it. In this class, this year around, I'm introducing weekly tests. Weekly tests are a low stakes way for you to keep up with the course material. And it's based on evidence. The evidence is that frequent small tests help you understand and retain material. There's ample evidence in the learning and psychology and literature on what's called the testing effect, the feedback effect, and the spacing effect. And if we can get all three of those together, we can do amazing things. So the testing effect is the, the fact that it's been shown the probability of you being able to remember and recall something in a testing environment is greater than if you just studied it on its own. Okay? So the fact of actually retrieving the item and recalling it creates a deeper sense, a deeper learning experience. If you couple that with feedback, you get a stronger effect. Feedback is being able to get feedback whether you did it correctly or not in a fairly short amount of time that can enhance the testing effect. And in addition to that, there's a spacing effect, which is if you review the material multiple times, and there's a spacing in between that, and that spacing can get longer and longer over time, that it, it enhances the ability of the fall as well. So um, I had a teacher in grade seven or six who gave me this analogy. Uh, she didn't call it the spacing effect, but she called it Basically, the idea is that if you think of a tent that you've set up and it's windy outside, you put 10 pegs in. If you put a single 10 peg in, it's like learning the material once, that tent is likely not going to stay. It's going to get ripped out and be blown away by the wind. If you put in the second 10 peg, you learn the material a second time, it's likely to stay a little bit. The third and the fourth time that you come and you revise the material and you look at it, you're putting in an extra 10 peg every time, it's likely that that material is going to stick and be retained. 
and be able for you to recall it in the future when you need to use it. So that is one way, one analogy that you can see the spacing effect in the testing effect. So this is very suitable to 4363 because of the way that the course is so cumulative and builds up across the weeks. So this is how I plan to run the testing. Every Sunday night at around 6 p.m. there will be the test posted. You have 33 hour period in which to work on that test. So you can pick when you want to start. Once you start though, you have to finish it within an hour. So it's like an ordinary test, you sit down, you're writing, you finish it. But the, the point at which you choose to start it is up to your agenda and how you fit it into your life. It will cover the work that I've taught in class the previous week. So once you start that test, you have an hour to finish it. However, I suggest you study prior to the test. Or just at least revise your notes. There's a, not there's going to be two or three questions, sometimes multiple choice, short answer, sometimes long answer, sometimes four or five questions if it's a slightly longer test. But you'll have ample opportunity to finish that test in the one hour period. <coughs> Once that testing window is up, uh, the answers will be shown, and so that's the feedback part of the testing coming in. So that we don't want to have the testing effect without the feedback effect. The feedback is important. So the answers will be shown, and where possible, some of the questions will be automatically graded by the computer. You'll see your solution and the grades right away. Some of the answers obviously cannot be automatically graded. You require a TA or myself to grade, so uh, that will come through a few days later. Each test will only be about 2%, and there should be about 11 tests throughout the term. Um, sometimes there may be fewer, but then they'll count 4%. So if I miss a week, the next week there'll be a bigger, slightly bigger test of 4%, maybe a slightly longer time. But um, you'll be able, at the end, the testing component will add it to 22%. So this replaces the two midterms I used to run. I used to run a midterm and a, and a midterm at the end. A midterm that will be 25% of the grade. These are fairly high stakes. If you're having a bad day, you're screwing up and you're going to reduce your grade. By switching to weekly tests, the stakes are much lower. You're not going to have a bad day every Monday. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so lower stakes than, than just having a few minutes. You can use anything you like during those tests. Mm -hmm. Notes, websites, internet, Google, whatever. As long as it's the only thing I require is that there's a code of honor and you're doing a test with yourself. So questions will be randomized, the data sets will be randomized, the numbers in the test will be randomized. However, if you're getting your buddy to do your question for you, your buddy is learning and not you. So at the end, you're going to suffer in the final exam. So on that, just on the rest of the grading, to wrap up. So there will be a midterm only if I cancel the weekly test. So right now it's an experimental system. If it's not working out, I'll cancel it and we'll schedule a regular midterm, giving credit for existing tests that have been done. The final exam will count 48%. It covers all the material, and there's a very important criteria here. If you do not get above 50% in the final exam, you will fail this course. Okay, despite your record in the assignments and the weekly tests. The final exam, if you mess that up, you fail the course. And that is a minimum requirement, and I'm inflexible on that. 50% all graded in the final exam to pass the entire course. It's a minimum requirement. You can bring anything to these exams and tests, both the notes, the library books, whatever your choice is, just no electronic devices. However, for the weekly test, feel free to use anything you like. Any electronic device. And then the final component of the grading is a 10% course project on design experiments. So there's more details on that on the course website. And I'll talk about it a bit more across the time. So just to wrap up then, these are some important dates to take take note of. The very first one here is if on Thursday at 10.30 you are free, there's a very interesting seminar in JH on 6 Sigma So if you've got that gap free, it's a one-hour seminar. Please come to that. It's a good background for this course as well as good background.